So I want to pull back from the immediacy of COVID, which is the disruption and the crisis we're facing right now, because let's set it in a, a bigger context. Let's think about the 21st century. This century has begun with repeated crises and disruptions from the financial crisis, the meltdown of 2008. We are in an era of climate breakdown. This is the defining breakdown and disruption of our times. And then most recently, countries across the world have lived through a year of COVID lockdown and we know there's more to come. These crises are emerging from the very systems we've created. We've created systems that depend upon and drive for endless expansion. Mark was talking about not needing always growth, but resilience. And it's that pursuit of growth endlessly that is underlying every one of these crises. And they have sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power, of global north and global south. So we need a new vision of what prosperity for humanity looks like in this century. And for this, yes, I offer you a donut. Imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating from the center of this picture. So we want to leave no one in the hole in the middle, falling short on the essentials of life without food and water, healthcare, education, housing. Leave no one in that hole. Get everyone into the green donut. But at the same time, we can't overshoot that outer ring. That's the life supporting systems of planet Earth. If we overshoot that, we destroy everything about this planet that makes it livable. And so we need to find the balance in a resilient, thriving way in that space in between where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And that is the green donut itself. And if that thriving in balance is the goal, Trouble is, we are way away from that goal right now. All of the red in this picture shows you the extent to which people are falling short on the essentials of life in the middle, without the food, water, education, healthcare, housing. We need to eliminate that red in the middle of the picture worldwide. But we're doing this in a context where we have already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries. We are way over on carbon emissions and climate change. We use far too much fertilizer and actually killing off lakes and rivers as a result. We've converted too much of our surface for land, for human use of cities and agriculture, and we are destroying biodiversity. We are collapsing the ecosystems that are the living web of life. So to me, this picture is humanity's selfie in these early days of the 21st century, and we are the first generation to see it. And every one of us has to realize that last century's economists, last century's politicians, last century's business leaders did not see this. So there's no way that they created economic policies and theories and business models that would solve it. This is our challenge. This is our vision and our realization of the situation we're in. So we need to come up with new economic policies and new business models that are actually fit for these times. And I sincerely believe that it's on the basis of this that our grandchildren and their children will look back at us right now and, and will judge us for what we did or didn't do once we knew, because we know. So what is it we're gonna to do to transform the systems that we run, the businesses we run, the, the countries we lead? I think we need to ask ourselves what happens when business meets the donut. And I've had fascinating conversations for the last eight years with so many different companies from three person startups to Fortune 500 companies. What happens when business sits in front of the donut and asks themselves, what is it about the business that we do? Is it helping to bring humanity in this space that meets the needs of all people and brings us back within the means of the planet? Or let's be a little bit honest with ourselves, the way we're making profit actually has been driving people out of this space. And how could business be part of transforming that? So the question is, is it even possible to do business in the donut? What would it mean to do that? And I think there are two fundamental dynamics that need to be put at the heart of 21st century business models that could make this possible. To be regenerative by design and to be distributive by design. And I'm just going to talk about what I mean by each of those. So the degenerative linear economy is the one we've inherited. We take Earth's materials, we make them into stuff we want, we use it for a while, often only once, and then we throw it away and we buy another one. And this take, make, use, lose is what pushes us over planetary boundaries. And this is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. And this is what it looks like when we throw our wastes again and again and again into Earth's sinks, into plastics, into lakes and rivers, and electronic waste into the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. And I think our grandchildren will look back at images like this in the archives and they will turn to us and say, did you know about this? Did you ever see this? Because they'll see it for what it is. It's, it's, it's a disgusting treatment of the living world and our fellow human beings. So this kind of industry, this kind of business has to be put in the past. We need to create 
industries that are circular or cyclical by design, where resources are never used up, they're used again and again, far more collectively, more creatively, more carefully. And that means we need to run on renewable energy. It means that we need to separate biological waste from synthetic materials. And we need to mimic nature's regenerative processes. So we need to refurbish, repair, reuse, recycle. We need to create products that are modular by design rather than glued shut. They are click open so that they can be repaired and they are not obsolete. So it goes to the heart of the business strategy of many, many companies creating products that can be used again and again rather than thrown away and buy another one. And here's an example of one company that's on its journey of transformation. So Interface Carpets a couple of decades ago was a sort of do nothing company. Sustainability wasn't of their concern. They were just happy making carpets. And then the CEO, Ray Anderson, learned about the sustainability crisis. He learned about cradle to cradle design and the idea that waste from one process becomes food for the next. And he had an epiphany and he said, I'm going to commit for Interface to be 100% renewable company by 2020, and we're going to turn the waste from old carpets into food for the next. And they began to do that, and they've had a massive drop in the waste produced by the factories. So far, so good. Interface have now gone to the next level. They've said, what would it mean, actually, to start reintegrating disposed materials from the world? So they now buy back fishing nets from the Philippines, fishing nets that are just ocean litter, and they are turning those fibers back into carpets. But they're also asking themselves about their factory. Here it is in New South Wales in Australia. That factory is an imposition and a, and a degradation on the landscape in which it sits. And so they said, what is nature's genius here? How does nature here in New South Wales, how much does it sequester carbon dioxide, store groundwater, cool the air from the treetops to the forest floor? How much does nature house biodiversity? And what if we made our factories do the same. What if our factories could be as generous as the nearby forest? So just as nature performs these ecological functions, can we design factories that Mima can do the same? And they're on that journey. To me, this is a company that's seeking to be regenerative by design, not only in its products, but in the very situation of its, in its landscape. So that's a beginnings of ideas about being regenerative by design. What about distributive by design? 20th century business models were designed and celebrated largely for centralizing the opportunities and values of enterprise, capturing as much value as possible for those who own the enterprise. And that's all three cheers for the shareholders, right? And that's the business models that we've inherited and that we've celebrated. And this drives extraordinary levels of inequality that we're seeing emerging with, with global billionaires, but also inequalities within countries between those who own shares and those who only earn wages. We need to create business models that are far more distributive by design, uh, far more equitable in sharing that value throughout the chain with all those who use and co-create it. And this again is about resilience. A distributed network is far, far more resilient than a tightly streamlined one. This opportunity is with us thanks to renewable energy distributed networks, thanks to communications. That means we can be running this conference right now in a distributed network because we've all got the, 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 commit, the communications equipment at home. We can have distributed networks of ideas through Creative Commons licensing. So there's a lot of 21st century technologies that are in our favor to enable distributed design and information and energy and production um, in a way that was never possible before. But it can even run at the heart of the way a business is run. So distributed design in terms of who owns a company and who owns the, the shares and returns. Employee owned companies like John Lewis Partnership or Huawei Phones means that the value of the company and the profits are in good part returning to the employees. But let's not only think about those employed by a company thinking down the supply chain, ensuring that fair and living wages are paid down the supply chain before a higher dividend is paid out to any shareholder. How can that not be the just thing to do? How can that not be the ethical way to run a business? Open design. This is Drupal, an open source software company. This is their annual um, R&D conference. It looks like a rock conference concert, but I think any major corporation would be hugely valuable hugely envious of the passion and the creativity of this open source community that come together and patch and code and co-create resources that they collectively use. And then lastly, paying a fair tax. So the fair tax commitment, which is, was launched in the UK a couple of years ago, simply says to companies, sign up and commit to paying the right amount of tax in the right place at the right time. And we know that many, many companies spend an awful lot of money ensuring they pay the least amount of tax in the fewest places possible, as rarely as possible. So these are some ways that you can bring distributive design into the heart of a business. 
So can we do business? Yes, it can be regenerative and distributed by design. But to me, the real question as to whether a business can do this lies in the design of the business itself. And this is what we call corporate psychotherapy. I invite you to reflect on the company that you work for, the one you're setting up, the one you lead, the one you're the CEO of, the one you love, the one you hate. Reflect on a company you know well and ask yourself, how is it designed? And does it even have the capacity to pivot towards being the kind of company we need in the 21st century? And what are the five key design traits? They're the ones that separate the extractive enterprise of the 20th century that always asked, how much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? From the 21st century company that asks a completely different question, how many benefits can we generate in the way we design this enterprise? Now, what is it that makes the difference? What leaves some in that extractive mode and allows others to dance in that far more generative space? Five design traits. First, purpose. What is the purpose of your enterprise? Why does it even exist? What is it in service to? Danish oil and natural gas was a fossil fuel company. So their purpose apparently was providing fossil fuels. They managed to look up a level and realize that the 21st century doesn't want that, doesn't need that. They looked up a level and said, let's be an energy company. And they transformed themselves into a 100% renewable energy company and had to change their name to be called Ørsted after the man who um, discovered um, uh, how to how to use dynamos and, and generate electricity. So transforming your purpose. And I invite you, what is the purpose of your company right now? Can you look up a level and actually repurpose that for 21st century needs? What about how your company is networked with its suppliers, its customers, its, its competitors who might be your allies in transformation? Good Energy, which is a 100% renewable energy company in the UK, really builds its relationships with its customers, with its suppliers, with its ecosystem, and those people who hold it to the values of its purpose and hold it to be resilient to those values when times get tough. And then onto governance. How is the company governed? What are the principles and practices that underpin your governance, the metrics and incentives given to managers? What are the cultures and norms that are put in place to hold the company to that purpose and those networks? Of course, many companies in the 20th century were driven by the quarterly report, which has to show every quarter growing sales, growing profits, growing market share. And that undermines the capacity of an organization to pivot into the direction we need to go. Some examples of companies that are actually putting governance in place that allows them to pivot, becoming a B Corp, writing into your articles of association. We are not here only to maximize shareholder returns. We're also here for social and environmental value. A simple, elegant move that clearly changes the purpose and the obligations of the company. Paul Pullman, the day he became CEO of Unilever, famously said, we're no longer going to issue these quarterly reports. And if you want them, you're in the wrong company. We're here for long-term returns, not for short-term ones. And then Triodos, a bank that is focused on environmental and social value, every Monday morning, they begin the week with a 45-minute meeting, talking about their purpose, talking about their values. And as the CEO told me, that instills that ethos throughout the working week. So purpose, networks, and governance, these are the easy ones. These are the easy design traits that can be pivoted. And I want to go deeper into the ones that really shape what a company can do and be in the 21st century. How is your company owned? Because how it's owned, whether it's owned by family, by shareholders, by venture capital, by founding entrepreneur, by its customers, by its employees, or by the state, all these different ownership models have profound implications for the deepest design trait, which is, of course, how it's financed and what that finance is demanding. And when it makes a profit, what that profit is purposed to do. And whether the finance coming to the company is saying, I want a fast and financial return, obviously, and that's the only reason I'm invested in you and why if I don't get it, I'm out. Or whether the finance that's backing your company says I'm investing because I, like you, am committed to long and purposeful social and environmental transformation with a fair financial return. But that's not the only reason I'm here. I'm here like you to transform, to make a difference, to be fit for the 21st century. So those design traits profoundly shape what a company can be and do. And I invite you to ask, what would it look like in your company to pivot them all to being a 21st century generative enterprise that can actually help bring us into the donut? Ask yourselves, what are the design traits that are pulling you back in that extractive mode and how can they be changed? And what are the design traits already in your enterprise that actually help you pivot into this future? So I invite you to sit at the table of the donut with your enterprise Bring your business to meet the donut and ask yourselves, how can we repurpose and redesign ourselves to help overcome the crises that humanity faces and to be 
actually an enterprise that brings humanity into this space. How do we become regenerative by design? How do we become distributive by design? What does that mean for us, for the industry that we're in, for the opportunity we have? And how do we look deep into our design traits and purpose ourselves so that we actually can be part of the transformation that we all know we need and that we already know we want? I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.